Hello, everybody, and welcome to the travel session. Um, hopefully, you're enjoying that music as much as we are. Um, it's it's uh, pretty awesome. So today, um, we've got 90 minutes packed full of um, travels that Ann Lister um, went on over her years. And so 90 minutes might feel a long time, but um, that's going to go very quickly. And we're probably still not going to have the amount of time needed to um, cover all of this stuff. So um, we've got nine amazing panelists that are going to go through all these travels um, and um, um, share all of this background with us. And so I am going to get started with introducing the actual sessions that we're going to cover today. So we, so starting off, one of the best travel quotes of Ann Lister's travels is going abroad, always likely to do good. People should not grow moldy at home, which I absolutely love that because um, I think uh, life is well lived full of adventures. So today's agenda, um, we are going to um, talk about private journals versus travel journals and how those how those are different um, and how she keeps those two, um, how she prepared for her travels and the different ways that she might have done that depending on what her traveling purpose was. Um, and we're going to talk about traveling companions, which I think for me is the fav my favorite part is how she acts differently with different um, traveling companions and, and the sorts of things that she does. And then of course, traveling in society, because of course, Anne enjoyed her society. Um, what it's like transcribing her travels um, and then <laughs> funny traveling stories um, in Anne's journals. And then um, we are going to jump into the actual research. So, you know, I, I've seen a lot of transcriptions out there where people and on their blog where they'll transcribe the journals and then go in into the details of sharing like the background of those locations or what was happening at the time. And, and to me, that's one of my favorite things. So, um, and then we are going to do a Q&A with the audience. So as we're going along, uh, get your questions ready, put them in the chat. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get to as many as possible. Okay, so first, um, we've got the Wales travel with Aunt Anne in 1822. I, yeah, I transcribed that one. I'm Jenna. Um, yeah, I uh, have been working on the transcription project. And when I started, I just requested to get pages from when Anne was traveling. So I've done a fair bit of traveling myself over the last few years and love traveling and love hearing about her adventures. So I just got lucky and happened to get her whale trip, which was a really, really cool trip to transcribe. So. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, next up. We've got France, Italy, and Switzerland with uh, Maria and Jane Barlow in 1827. So I'm Catherine. Um, I'm one of the Anne Lister code breakers. I don't really seek out Anne's travels. I like to see where I get placed in the journals each time I get a new transcription batch, but I tend to jump around quite a lot. So I've had different travels across different years and it's really nice to see how they all compare with each other. But this one with Maria and Jane is probably one of my favorites. Awesome. Ooh. And this one might be my favorite, but I'm going to try not to be biased during this session. <laughs> We've got Wales and Dublin with Maria Lawton in 1826. Yeah, my name is Janneke and I didn't actually do the transcript for this. Um, that was uh, Susanna Piotrowski, but I worked on the story map with her um, and I helped a little bit with the, uh, the transcript. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm here. Very cool. Okay, we're gonna follow that up with Scotland with Sabella McLean in 1828. Oh, Amanda, you uh, unmute yourself real quick. I always do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm Amanda Price, I'm part of the transcription project and I started off with Scotland by reading um, a blog by, um, well a website really, by Lee Mitchinson who has a fantastic website um, called I know my own heart .uk, and I read all of her transcripts for Scotland because she has she has transcribed the entire trip um, and decided to make a story map with it which she gave me permission to do and then fortunately I actually got a batch 
of Scotland transcripts uh, to go through from the archives in 1828. And so it was sort of a double whammy. It was great. Awesome. Okay. Next, um, maybe another one I might enjoy is The Netherlands with Maria Lawton, 1831. Well, I certainly enjoyed this. And to be fair, um, the reason I started on this one was obviously because I'm from the Netherlands. And I think a, a few of us um, have this sort of reasoning behind why we're here, because I was just amazed that she'd even been to the Netherlands. And um, I was very curious to know where she'd been and what she'd, you know, got up to. And um, um, unfortunately, she, she, she never went to where I live, um, but we were within 15 kilometers. So in a way, it's like 200 years and 15 kilometers, which is, I thought was quite cool. Um, I started doing this really because Anshoma sort of said, you know, you should go for it yourself. And this was even before the, I knew of the project, the, the archives project. Um, and having gone through this and figuring that I could actually read what she had written, um, that's what prompted me to go and join the archives project as well. Very cool. Well, I'm glad that you gave us some Mariana Lawton content. So thank you. Next, we've got the South of England, which she took as a solo trip um, in 1831. Uh, yep, I am also have transcribed that one. And again, it was just a batch that I was given for um, the transcription project I just looked out. So it was just a spontaneous one month trip before moving to Hastings. So it's an interesting one also. Very cool. <clears throat> and then we've got San Sebastian with Ann Walker in 1838. I'm Jess Vedic um, and I was, I just got assigned this. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, sort of early on showed a bit of you know, a decent level of competency for transcribing Anne's plain hand. So I tend to get assigned things that are a little bit later. And this was absolutely one of my favorites uh, to, to, to transcribe. This trip is amazing. Um, and I can't wait to talk to it, talk to you guys about it. It's gonna be fun. Hmm. Ooh, now we've got the Pyrenees with Lady Stuart de Rossi and Anne Walker at two different times, 1830 and 1838. Okay, oh, so uh, <laughs> Kat did 1830, so she can tell you more about that. But uh, hi, everyone. My name is Marlene Oliveira. I'm a code breaker and a contributor to Pact with Potential. And I transcribed uh, Adventure in the Pyrenees in 1838 with Anne Walker, which I got curious about ever since I read the Vivian Ingham's paper about the ascent of Mont Minimal. Uh, and that has been one of the things I had wanted to do since the even before I found the transcription project. So it was fun uh, to, to go about and do it. Very nice. And then um, uh, Kat, are you um, the 1830 with Stuart Rosny? Yes, so in 1830, Anne went on a trip with Lady Stuart de Rosse to the Pyrenees and quite an interesting trip. It's quite society full. It was taking place during the French, the Paris Revolution in the summer of 1830 and that causes quite a lot of challenges for them on that early part of that trip. Oh nice exciting. Okay now we've got another Ann Walker trip the Norway Sweden and Finland in 1839. Yeah I think we're a couple have done this. Uh, Tirola you worked on this. I focused on Norway because I'm um, from Norway or in Norway. And uh, I was just looking for diary pages on the, of the archives and realized there was a listing of a map of Norway, which of course triggered me <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, this was before they, I mean, we had, to, I think I found it on Her Story or something, these journals. And um, it's just amazingly fun to write, read about her traveling through parts that I know well and uh, <laughs> can find. and. And um, so it was a natural thing for me to dive into it uh, full force. And now I'm trying to share it with others on my own, this uh, analystenorway.com webpage, because you find so many interesting things and it's just a lot of fun. Hi, I'm uh, Ylva Nilsson. And uh, for the same reason as Yvonne, I started to transcribe the journals uh, through Sweden just because I'm Swedish. 
Um, and then I got invited to do a story map with uh, Adeline uh, Lim and uh, got connected with the uh, pack with potential and did a test for cold breakouts also. So that's the reason why I'm here. Hi, I'm Doriana Shirola. Um, I'm from Croatia, but I live in Canterbury, UK. Uh, and I'm a transcriber with the West Yorkshire Archive Services Transcription Project. And uh, in for one of my earlier batches, uh, I got given basically all of the uh, Belgian trip with Anne Walker in 1838 um, and part of France um, before they decided to go to the Pyrenees. And that gave me a thirst for Anne's travels. And uh, when I realized that um, the Norway, Sweden, Finland, and St. Petersburg parts of, of, of the trip were not covered in the journals at all. And therefore, they are not at present uh, part of the transcription project. I decided now we can't leave that lie. Uh, I've got to transcribe this. Um, so I started transcribing it. And so far, it's been a blast. And I've been publishing um, all of it on my blog. Very, very cool. OK, so next, now we're getting into um, those uh, in travels, Russia and the Caucasus with Anne Walker in 1839 through 1840. That's again several of us. Um, Marlene, do you want to kick it off? Uh, I'm, I have the end, so maybe you should go with the start. Yeah, well, well you've got the start in Moscow. Um, then I've got them kicking their heels, uh, impatient to get off uh, for, for like a month. And um, then they travel down the Volga and get to the Caucasus. And that's where it all gets hairy and very, very interesting. <laughs> Jessica, did you have also? Uh, yes, uh, I transcribed it quite a bit of um, Anne and Anne in Russia, but mostly when they are um, in cities visiting with society, which I know not everybody really likes, but I absolutely love to hear about the different people that they meet, especially if it's somebody who's historically important um, in, a, in a whole other context, you know, finding these connections that Anne makes. It's fascinating, so... Okay, so I went a bit overboard on this one uh, and I wanted the adventure in context. So I took the whole final volume as my summer project and it was absolutely fantastic. They go from Moscow in February and go through uh, you know, to Nizhny Novgorod and Kazan and then they go down the Volga all the way to Astrakhan uh, and then have fun in a little bit that's more like a desert until they reach uh Kisliar and then from there uh, it's Vladikavkaz, Tiflis, uh, Baku, then they go back to Tiflis, then Kutais, then Zugdidi and apparently they managed to go back to Kutais which is where and unfortunately died. Yes, unfortunately. Hashtag. <laughs> okay, this is it. Okay. So our panelists, you just met everybody. Um, and now what I'm going to do is go through and um, just start asking questions to get the um, conversation moving. Okay, so to get started, um, so we'll, um, let's dive into the whole um, preparation part. So Ann Lister, you know, she prepared for her travels in lots of different ways. Um, and so let's kick off with um, Amanda, like, with your with your travels, um, what was your um, experience of you know reading about and transcribing this part of her preparation? Um, I've had a couple of bits actually, and I was just looking the other day at my new batch, and I noticed that Anne had started. She'd she'd mentioned in the in the eighteen twenty eight pages that she was interested in travelling to Northern Ireland to see the Giant's Causeway. She never actually did it then, but then she had written a letter to a steamboat company just inquiring about how she would get there you know when the boats travel so she was corresponding by letter with different companies to find out when these when she would be able to get the boats and I thought that's really interesting I had never seen that before um, and she and then she she obviously had a return letter transcribed the whole thing into her diary don't really understand why but it's great for me but um yeah I thought that was fascinating um so yeah she she I don't think she ever actually did see the Giant's Causeway, but uh, she certainly mentioned it a couple of times. 
But oh. um, yeah, I had noticed that when she was traveling in Scotland, she always took a guidebook with her. She had, um, what was it called? The Scottish tourist. She took it everywhere and she compared everything that she saw with what had been written in the Scottish tourist to see whether or not it was accurate, I'd imagine. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, actually. And then obviously she writes in her diary um, what page of Scottish tourist she's actually reading on that day. So mm. when I was transcribing it, I went to have that page of, of the actual book. I found the book on Google, um, Google Books and I was sort of looking to see, oh, well, that's what that page of that book said. And this is what Anne said. So you could sort of compare and contrast, contrast the two, which is, yeah, this was interesting, really interesting. But oh, yeah, wow. I'm, I think as well, she also, um, she took advice from friends. She would always sort of, um, in her letters to Tib, I know that Tib traveled quite a lot, um, Isabella Northless. She was always sort of saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm traveling here, I'm traveling here. And I think Anne in the beginning was maybe a little bit jealous or sort of desperate to go off traveling herself. So I think she took a lot of advice and inspiration from her friends to get herself abroad or at least somewhere. Well, um, I, I'm very curious, what was her opinion of the Scottish um, tourists? Was it um, accurate or did she have things to say about it? <laughs> oh, you know, Anne, she's always got things to say about something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, Jessica, so like with all of your um, um, Russia stuff, so how was there differences with that on her travel preparations? Oh, no, she always seems to have some sort of travel guide, at least one, sometimes several that she checks in between. Um, yeah. And it's, it's been really fun tracking down, you know, uh, contemporaneous copies of these books, scans from different uh from Google Books, you know, that come from libraries all over the place. And you can actually tell step by step, okay, now she's going to probably go here or she has this option that's, you know, outlined in the travel guide that she might go to. And sometimes, you know, if, if a roadblock pops up, she's like, oh, that's fine. I will, you know, we'll readjust and we'll go some other direction. I know that she does this a lot and um, she did this in France. I know she does it uh, a little bit. Um, I transcribed a tiny little piece of the Norway trip. Um, yeah, so you can you can tell exactly where she is. She's following, and she goes to bookstores and picks up new guides for places she wants to go in the future. So her wheels are always spinning regarding travel and where she wants to go in the future. Huh. All right, cool. Um, uh, Jenna, did you was was it similar for um, those trips in Wales and like that time she went solo? Um, yeah, it's pretty similar. Um, she yeah. So before Wales, that was a much more planned trip. Um, so she, yeah, she got some published itineraries. She read a multitude of geology and mineralogy books, trying to figure out where all the cool rocks were in Wales. Um, and she also contacted friends and stuff. So she, she wrote to Isabella Dalton, Tib's cousin, um, asking if she knew anybody who knew the ladies of Lingoflin who could give her an introduction. Um, and Mariana had been to Wales a few years before in 1817. And so she brought with her the two descriptive letters that she had gotten from Mariana. Cool. Um, and then for her trip around Southern England, that was a much more like spontaneous trip. So there, there was very little planning beyond um, Veer reading her her own journal of her trip around the Isle of Wight and then just talking to like uh, Lady Stuart de Rothsay about interesting castles and stuff in the area. But then she would, it was a very fluid trip where she would kind of decide as she went and whenever she got somewhere new, she would always go find a bookstore and she would buy a guidebook for the town that she was in. So cool. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, so yeah, uh, as, as we all know how detailed Anne is, then obviously it makes sense that she would prepare and, and, and do all that stuff for all of her travels. Um, so with these travels and the different companions that she was with, um, you know, um, I'm guessing, or I would assume maybe that she might do things differently depending on the companion that she's with. So um, um, Doriana, with your travels, with your um, I'm sorry, uh, Yilva, with your travels, um, what was um, 
what was your experience with what she, how she was like with her companions? Um, well, she traveled with um, Miss Walker and um, she always considered Anne's uh, opinions on how they were going to work, uh, travel. And she asked her, if she, uh, sometimes Anne got very anxious about uh, perhaps going up uh, a mine in a bucket. So she said, okay, we take the stairs instead. <laughs> um, but sometimes she, she actually didn't consider Anne's feelings that much. Uh, when she passed from Denmark to Sweden, uh, they were going across the sound and um, they were going in an open boat with their carriage and the carriage was too big. So the, the front wheels, they were hanging over the boat uh, reeling. And um, at first Miss Walker didn't want to go on that boat, but uh, Anne was determined and said, I'm going with this one uh, with the carriage and with the luggage. So, and instead of taking the other boat later, by herself, she and uh, Miss Walker followed and was pretty pleased afterwards. It was a very calm and, and good voyage across the sound. I, I love that. I think there might be a um, team no bucket starting because um, that totally makes sense why somebody might not want to get into a bucket and go somewhere. So, but you know, it's okay. Anne. Um, so, um, um, Yannicka, like with your travels, um, was she different with, with, with the companions for those? Well, both the travels that I am here representing um, were with Mariana. Uh, the difference being that the first one, um, chronologically, was with Mariana and Charles and Mr. Duffin. So obviously, that's a completely different uh, group of people than just traveling with Mariana, her, her girlfriend. Um, and I thought it was very interesting how much she got up to with Marianne, even though Charles was sort of sleeping in the next room. Um, so, so that was just interesting, um, to say the least, um, because they did manage to get up to all sorts. Um, um, and I guess what was interesting about Marianne going to the Netherlands was also her response to when they arrived in the Netherlands um, and them ending up more or less in the middle of a a civil war because um, Belgium was actually trying to get independent at that particular point. So when they arrived in Flitingen um, um, just a few days before, there'd been all sorts of skirmishes and actual, well, very dangerous sounds of cannons and all sorts. And they were, well, they were told by um, another Englishman, I, I believe, believe he was a tradesman who, who was in uh, Flitingen at that point, and Mariana got so scared that she really wanted to turn around and immediately go back. Um, but Anne, being Anne, uh, figuring, well, we're here now, um, said, well, do you know what? We'll just stay for a week. And I'll, I promise that we'll go back in a week, but we'll be fine. Um, and apparently Mariana was either um, persuaded with that or she just had no choice. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to see how Anne influences her company and how the company influences her compared to what um, Ilva was saying before, she did listen to her um, traveling partners, but she clearly had very much her own opinion and her own wishes, um, especially in this Netherlands situation where Mariana would have turned back straight away and, and was like, ah, we'll just give it a go for a week. And if, if it gets too dangerous, we'll come back. Right. Um, did you notice, so like with the trip where the Charles and Mr. Duffin are there, did she, did that seem, I know she, you said that she had some fun with Mariana, but that, did that seem to hamper or change the, the, the way that she um, did things with the two of them tagging along? I suppose what hampered a lot was that uh, she was, she, as the trip went on, she grew more and more annoyed with Charles. In the beginning, she actually refers to how um, how actually well he's behaving and how pleasant it all is. Uh, and then there's a sort of turnaround. Uh, I can't ex remember exactly what happened, but Charles got annoyed about something or other. Uh, and eventually it turned out that Charles is just annoyed um, with the, the scarf that they're wearing. Or, and, and, he's, and he starts being really mouthy about those so, sort of details. And then um, Anne writes, you know, 
stuff like well similar to I wish you know he wasn't here and what a pain and I can't wait for this to be over and uh, so it, yeah obviously it does have an influence on how they're getting on because there's extra people tagging along and I think Anne might have preferred just um, having had Mariana there. <laughs> yeah um, Kat uh, what was what um, what was your experience like with with the companions? Um, I think having done several travels with several different companions, it's quite interesting to draw similarities and differences between Anne's experience with those companions. And one of the big similarities between both Maria Barlow and Lady Stuart is that Anne feels quite trapped when she's traveling. Maria, because she's quite on top of Anne, she wants to be in the same room as Anne all the time. She gets really upset when Anne's writing. She gets really frustrated because Anne just doesn't really want to be with her and whenever Anne gets a room to herself she notes in the diary and she says how delighted she is that she can be on her own and get things done um, and on one occasion there's a quote which I quite like about Maria when she Anne does not want to share a room whatsoever and she describes Maria as having a face as long as a fiddle which is quite funny and she's very observant as to how her companions sort of are with her and she's she does her frustration is so palpable through the pages so she manages not to incur a cross over Maria or do anything sexual with her she congratulates herself she says oh it's almost like oh thank god that didn't happen and you get similarities with Lady Stuart but on that case it's very much more about the society she's with this very posh woman and there's all sorts of things going on so how does she act with people she meets a lot of society people on that trip too so there's a lot of, she's like, oh, do I stand up and greet people when they come in? Who do I shake hands with? What's the etiquette at tea time? That sort of thing. And there's a quote, there's two quotes, which I particularly like about I'm feeling trapped. And one of them starts with, I'm heartily tired of this life of travel. It will be a good lesson for me for the future. I began this morning to count the day to my release. I get no real walking. I'm getting rather fatter and all day tortured by dress too tight. And for a woman who doesn't tend to comment on her sort of physical appearance it's quite interesting that her feeling trapped is almost making her reflect on what she's getting done and what she's not able to do and how that is affecting her more physically and there's another quote which is quite similar and it says I behave very well about it but I feel I cannot be independent free as air and this gene does not suit I will get rid of it and take care how I trammel myself again so I think it's a bit much, and especially because there's the revolution going on in Paris and there's a whole hoo-ha about where they're going to go next. And at one point they end up in Pau and they want to continue, but Lady Stuart's not sure if they're gonna to have to flee France or go to England. And Anne's very adamant if that happens, she will go back to Paris to collect Anne, Anne first. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, so uh, Jess, with your Russia stuff and, um, and uh, with Anne Walker, what was that like? by the time um, she years. Oh, uh, well, it, it's actually interesting. I would so love to, to hear even just a, a line or two from Ann Walker about you know how she was interacting and what she felt like. Because when you read it from Ann's perspective, whenever they go out to dinner, Ann keeps a list of who she met and what they did and, and, and you know references as to uh, why this person is important and where they might be useful for her in the future. Um, she also does talk uh, about, um, you know, and you know, kind of making her her own little friends within this cadre of people as well. And so I I, I know maybe something's out there someday we'll find. But um, and Lister is all about you know making connections. Who's going to be useful in the future? If I need to get a letter of introduction or if I want to go into a certain area that's typically off limits, she's always you know keeping a, a checklist in the back of her mind of, of what acquaintances and what friends and what society people she can really, you know, uh, use for her benefit. Um, to me, I, I, I mentioned the other day, she almost seems like, uh, for, for those of you fans of Debbie Reynolds musicals, uh, uh, almost like uh, the unsinkable Molly Brown in that she was very good at sort of mingling with high society and other places, whereas she didn't feel as respected back home. Um, and she really does, uh, you know, actually seem to get some level of respect when she's in these distant places from people who are uh, far higher than uh, she was ranked in society and, and uh, she meets princesses and counts and generals and uh, you know governors of different areas and for the most part everybody's like oh Miss Lister what can I do for you and I'm sure that she 
I'm <laughs> sure that she's a, uh, she, she just loves that. Um, but uh, I will say in earlier travels, especially uh, when she's with Anne uh, going to San Sebastian, uh, she does absolutely take Anne's feelings into perspective. Um, but then again, at the very end, uh, Anne Lister, no one's going to really stop her from doing what she wants to do, as long as she makes sure that her companion is, you know, all right and taken care of. So in this particular case, um, both Anne's get on this little tiny uh, boat, this little chaloupe, um, and it's so small, uh, Ann Walker asks, how are we supposed to do anything with this boat? It doesn't even look like there's room for rowers. And then, you know, four rowers show up. They get on the water for about five minutes. And um, for those of you who have seen the, the film Portrait of a Woman on Fire, um, in the very opening scene where they're riding in, where uh, she's riding in that boat and it's so nauseating and it's, it's, you know, just the sea is heaving. That's kind of what the description of, of those two in that boat sounds like to me. Anne Walker grabs Ann Lister's hand and basically says, I can't bear another moment of this. Take me back. Um, they have to put in uh, at a nearby island. And, you know, Ann Lister's like, are you sure you're OK? I'll go back with you. Or is it all right if I continue going? Of course, you know, Anne's probably writing it uh, in the best light she possibly can. But they agree finally that Ann Walker is going to go back to their hotel and, um, she'll just be gone for a night Anne continues on her journey and it's probably a great thing that Ann Walker got off of the boat when she did and went back because you know the trip ends up being a lot longer on the boat and Anne is quite famous for her seasickness um, yeah. she's not do very well on ships on boats but she powers through it um, and finally gets to San Sebastian and when she gets home um, she rushes to see Anne make sure Anne's okay because Anne wasn't feeling good to begin with and you know but she's always always has that concern in the back of her mind. Wow. <laughs> um, so a quick question on Ann Walker. So when they were meeting society, did she seem as interested in society as um, Ann Lister was? I don't really seem to, to, to get that as, as much that, that Ann Walker was as interested in sort of collecting all of these different acquaintances. Um, but she definitely, it's not like she's a wallflower left alone. Uh, she does make her own friends at all of these different dinner parties when they're you know stuck in a place for weeks at a time or a month or something like that um and seems to make her own little group of friends as well people that she can chat with at these these events um and that sort of lets ann lister you know go dominate the conversation somewhere else with some other group of people um so ann walker seems like she's she's fairly comfortable within this too she's not the you know completely shy um i'm sure she had anxiety but you know I would too. <laughs> so, um, but I, I don't think Ann Walker's as interested in making the connections. That's more of a Ann Lister thing, I think. Just yeah, I see Marlene hands up for Ann Walker. Okay, so just to add to that, uh, I think it depends on the company because in Tiflis uh, and as friends, uh, usually younger people, uh, the Golovins, um, and well, she interacts with many of them, but, uh, but it's. Uh, a society set up a, a setting so they go places they meet people they have dinners she talks with uh, people even at other places like casa uh, in the pyrenees it happens also but not to the same extent but the the part of the the caucasus trip uh, i thought more interesting on uh, on the the society interactions uh foreign walker uh, was baku since uh, the Czech Marevs in Baku were particularly uh, fond of them, they kept sending them food, and uh, even Anne was building, uh, building sorry, assembling a, a dress made with silks from uh, they bought there. They had patterns. Uh, they uh, talked about uh, food and visited lots of places. And those people were actually very, very nice to them. The, it was the first time in the the whole trip, and Lister actually left someone her address at Shipden Hall and literally told them before she, they left, please write to me uh, to the care of Hammersley's and uh, they will forward to Shipden if I'm uh, at Shipden. But obviously Hammersley's then, uh, well, they went bankrupt or some legal trouble happened. So if the Czech Marefs even, uh, well, wrote back, those letters probably ended up lost. Yeah. Wow, very cool. Um, okay, so on to the like background research of all of these travels. So right when you guys are transcribing, you're creating story maps, um, and you know, um, uh, 
let's touch on like how you've all have delved deeper into the research of like the, the, the background and what was happening at the time. So um, Yvonne, with your travels, um, what sorts of research have you delved into for that? Um, well, I think it's pretty much the same resources we all have. We go online and dig, 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 <laughs> dig, 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 and find little hints or small lead and follow that. And it goes nowhere or it goes right where you want it to go. You find an old map or you find something that apparently was completely irrelevant and suddenly sheds light on something else you're looking for. A lot of accidental finds and um, it's online, it's libraries, it's Google, of course, history sites, stuff like that. Dig, dig, dig. Oh, yeah. Um, Yilva, what was your, um, um, what sort of uh, research have you done on your travels? Well, like all of us, I spend a lot of time on Google. <laughs> Uh, but I've also done some uh, archive researches, um, especially I'm trying to find out if uh, Anne Walker made the same journey back from Moscow uh, without Anne Lister through Sweden or not. And uh, so I'm looking at all the um, inns uh, in Sweden. They, some of them left uh, day books in which the uh, travelers were obliged to put their names in. And um, there are lots of them are lost, so I, I'm not sure I can get it, but I'm, I'm going down that rabbit hole and try to find it. And if there is any uh, record of Anne Walker going through Sweden again in 1940, 41, then I will find it. Mm, awesome. Um, Amanda, what about uh, any research that you've done for, for, for your travels? Yeah, I did a bit of research, mostly to find images, actually. I made a story map, um, a travel map of Scotland, well, half of the Scotland trip that she did with Sibylla MacLean um, in 1828. And I, I just went looking for images of, the, of Scottish sites that she saw, just to sort of figure out what she would have seen uh, when, she, when she was traveling. Um, and I actually found quite quite a good, a good amount, um, but in in the same way as everybody else, you know, looking through internet archives, Google, just to find more information, plotting the journey on on um, Google Maps, just to figure out like how far she actually went. I mean, what's fascinating about Anne is the previous batch that I did for the West Yorkshire Archive Transcription Project was a batch of index pages from 1828 where she indexed her entire journal that inter that entire volume and she also indexed the entire itinerary for the Scotland trip so she wrote every single place that she went um, and then categorized all the different sites that she saw including cathedrals locks glens castles just like itemized absolutely everything <laughs> which I found incredible, absolutely incredible. She, she calculated the mileage for the whole trip and I can't, I didn't get the, I didn't go in and get the mileage, but it's like, like a ridiculous amount of mileage that she did. And if you think about how she would have been traveling at the time, you know, coaches, steamboats, little carts, it's just stunning. And I think it, I think it ended up being about 2000 miles. I mean, this is old Scottish miles. Jenna and I had exactly the same batch. So if that's correct, Jenna, confirm for me. I think it was about 2000 and something miles, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was just over 2000, I think. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to do the second part of the map and I'm going to plot the second half of it just to and, and see if the um, mileage adds up <laughs> in today's numbers. So, okay, so that brings uh, a very uh, cool point up. So I know there's been lots of talks about the different um, measurements and things like that, that she had to switch around where she was going. Um, so like to put it into perspective for everybody, what's the difference of a Scottish mile versus like a mile that we're used to? Or is there, do we know? Not sure. <laughs> Awesome. We did we did some of research into this a couple of weeks ago, a group of us, and I can't remember 
what we came up with, but we spent a good like half an hour trying to figure out and convert the mileage. I don't know if we ever resolved it, but the, I mean, this is the type of thing that we do. <laughs> you take something as obscure as that and try and figure it out. I think I looked at it a bit when we were when we were working on that itinerary and there was a Scottish mile, but it had basically kind of gone out of use by mm -hmm. the time and was traveling around. So I think we decided that she was most likely still talking English miles at this stage. Yeah, possibly. I just looked it up really quick. <laughs> and uh, apparently a Scottish mile is a touch longer than, a, than an English mile. Um, it is roughly equivalent to, let me get this right. Um, it could vary from place to place, but apparently it was equivalent to about 1.81 kilometers. So okay. there you go, if that helps anybody. <laughs> wow. wow, yeah, so, so not only was she trying to prepare for all these travels, going to all these different places before Google, but then she was having yeah. to be aware of all of these different measurements and, and, and obviously languages and what was happening. So that's, that's, that's uh, yeah, just fascinating. Let me just add really quick. I found very interesting when she's travel traveling in revolutionary France, um, if you guys aren't aware, um, the uh, measurement system, me units of length and everything else, um, that does change during the revolution to, to, to fall in line with a more rationalistic sort of scientific approach to measuring things instead of relying on old standards of, oh, this is, you know, how long, you know, something can travel in a day or something like that. And so when she pulls up a lot of these really sort of to us nowadays, kind of archaic measurements for things like buying bolts of cloth and stuff, it, it really becomes difficult to understand uh, really what she's talking about when she talks about, I bought three versts of this and then, and then I bought, you know, 11 L's of this to make a dress. And it's, it, it, you have to go look all that stuff up and it's no stuff that nobody really uses anymore. Um, so that's a little bit harder to dig around and find, but it is fascinating to find out that they had entirely different measurement systems at various times in various places uh, because of wars and things like that. So it's interesting. And of course, if I may add, there's the different types of miles in Scandinavia and she talks about mountain miles and uh, German miles and all sorts of miles. And she talks also about currency like the Swedish uh, money, Norwegian, and the shilling here is not the same as a shilling there. And when she did her accounts, uh, she had to do this switch uh, from marks to shillings to the other shillings to, to uh, sum up because she was very thorough in her accounts. Wow. So it's pretty, pretty demanding. Does she ever mention like how she finds all this information? Like how at the time? Like, how would one even know to, like, know how to convert all of that stuff? Does she ever mention that thing or did, does she just do it? I do know that um, on her travels in uh, southern France uh, with Lady Stuart de Rossi uh, in 1830, she does mention in the diaries and in one part that I transcribed, uh, asking people's opinions of what their bankers are giving them for exchange rates, then trying to find out what's the best rate and then going there. That's usually how she uh, determines what the exchange rate is because it can fluctuate. I do remember she got particularly angry because I, I guess inflation was really bad <laughs> that particular time. And she's like, oh, I should have gone to this other person in this other city. They offered me a much better rate, but you know, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Doriana, uh, what, um, did you run into any of these things or like when you were researching your travels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I research every single thing that, that she mentions from, from people and, and places that she visits, sites that she mentions, uh, even just in passing, uh, plants that, 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 she, that she mentions at length every time she's anywhere with, with the botanical gardens, uh, she has to go there and note every plant that she sees. And one thing she frequently does, oh, mm, this would, be, would really work well for Shibden, or this is uh, a really nice architectural bit that I could uh, use in Shibden, or I could plant uh, th this flora border in, in Shibden, or I could use this kind of shelving in Shibden. And it's uh, really heartbreaking to, to see it on, on the last trip because that, of course, never happens. Um, and when you research, I mean, it's when you transcribe, as I, I think Sally Wainwright said many times, when that it's different when you see someone else's transcription and then transcribe yourself. When when you transcribe yourself, it's like, like you're there with her, and it goes uh, that goes like multiple times for when you actually research it, because you really see as see as it, see it through her own eyes. You, you you really see yourself transplanted there, 
and um, when I uh, publish my transcriptions and try to include all of the information, mostly via links, so that other people can actually go through it as well, because it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's, it's really like you're there with her. And the, the amount of, the kind of information that, that, that she's absorbing and, and then um, giving to us is, is, is just amazing. She was just interested in everything. And, you know, you, you will end up researching everything from like, um, early steam digging excavator, excavators um, through Finnish um, uh, Russian military maps of Finland in order to find some station that has not existed for 150 years and, and she stayed there and it's just amazing. So you spend, you spend sometimes hours on, on trying to pinpoint one particular person and, and, and then when you find them and then you realize oh this is someone really interesting who, who's had an, an amazing life and um, ends up being mentioned in several works of Russian literature and, 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 and she met him it's just amazing she had a knack for, for meeting people who were like just unbelievable not, not just you know kind of aristocratic politically important people that she would have met um, in, in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg or, or Caucasus or, or Astrakhan circles but random people that, that, that she meets up with and end up being extremely, extremely interesting. It's just, it's just a whirlwind tour through, through the early 19th century. If, if, if she were, you know, if, if you were making some sort of a film um, about, about that era and you, you were trying to sort of write in a character who meets all of these people, I, you know, people would think, you know, it's, you know, it's not really believable that this person will be like this and that it should meet all of these um, incredibly interesting people who are important uh, and uh, that year, but she did and she was and was real. I mean, yeah. and one of the things, uh, one of the um, directions that I would really like, I don't know if, the, if, this, if it's going to happen, that I would like uh, the transcription project to go when everything is transcribed is to include all of these references, to include all of these annotations, because I think that would just be amazing. It would just all come to life. Oh yeah. In fact, um, I think Livia added that to the chat. Um, we've tagged the new term um, hashtag anhole because like you said, the rabbit holes of going down all of these random um, <laughs> pieces of research and, and you know coming across random things, you definitely end up down this rabbit hole of an information and, and you end up learning so much. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my favorite part. So um, going on, I saw some more chat. Um, uh, references in the chat about the difference between her travel journals and the main journals and and what that difference was um so yannica um what was your what have you found to be the difference with your travels oh did we did you freeze i think you froze okay let me um okay so cat what about you? What was your, what was the difference you found? What was the question? Um, the difference between the travel journals and the main oh, journal. Okay. Yeah. What you um, I think there is quite a, um, there's quite a big difference. I think it was Ilva who found the quote in the journal not too long ago from 1827 where Anne states the differences between them. So I will let Ilva expand on that later, but um. There is a big difference and you see in the travel journal she documents things like what she sees where she goes more about the practicalities of traveling so she'll note like oh fine rock or very nice castle and things like very picturesque views and doesn't necessarily encroach on the um, more personal side of traveling you do get bits of code in the travel journals not that i've particularly read what they include but there are bits and pieces in there but when you get to the main journals and particularly during 1827, they're draft entries and they don't cover the whole trip. She stops partway through, which is possibly because of Maria's dislike of her writing all the time. But um, you get a lot more of the personal. So you get what they get up to sexually, how she feels about how she feels about Maria in general. She'll make comments about her and Jane. She doesn't particularly like Jane on this trip. She finds her a bit irritating she keeps making comments about her and Maria's arguments and I think she and comments about something like a lady of 16 ought to know better than to interject and interfere in our um, relationships I would say so you get a lot more of her reflections on that travel how she feels about it and particularly with that trip in 1827 as well a lot of the coded sections are things like oh I wish Mariana was with me I think Mariana's not quite so well at that point in time so she's anxious to hear about her 
really wants to know what's going on at home and she keeps wishing herself back at home as well and that's all in code that uh -huh. you don't really get to see in the main journals. Very cool. Um, I see we've got Yannicka back. Um, did you want to share what the, the differences you found with the travel journals and main journals? Yeah, sorry, the, it all grayed over and my Zoom went weird. But anyway, I'm back. Um, I guess uh, one of the main differences um, that was very noticeable for doing the Netherlands trip is that it is actually only um, a travel notes trip. And um, if you go to the journal for the same dates in August uh, 1831, you will find 10 pages of blankness in the journals, um, which is really, I, I think it's such a shame because I know that from the notes that she took and that, that I transcribed, um, surely she would have had a lot to say, a lot more than, um, I mean, the notes were really, I think just uh, for her to sort of remember the stuff and then later fill them all in and, and flesh them out. And I think um, especially because in a letter later on, um, uh, Mariana and Anne refer to this particular trip as the ill-fated journey. Um, you know, there could have been so much more that she could have described uh, and whether the what exactly was the ill-fatedness could have been a few things. I mean, I mentioned the uh, civil war, which may have played a part, but but also um, they seem to have both not been very well. Uh, obviously, Anne has lots of bowel issues. Um, she describes meals, and then you think, well, no wonder the next day you had an issue. But 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 also, um, you know, they must they did feel unwell, um, and and that's another thing that surprises me whenever I read well a lot of her in her journals, but especially when traveling that. She describes how unwell she feels, and yet there she is going out to the next, you know, climbing another mountain or or going to the top of, of, of some cathedral or, or other. So despite the ill-fatedness, if you look at the notes, they did a lot of fun stuff and, and, and go on um, with their lives and with their sightseeing, um, despite how they felt. But yeah, um, travel notes versus the journal. The journal is obviously a lot more fleshed out in and she describes a lot more and in the travel notes there are there are bits in crypt but like the rest of the notes they're just smaller and and just notes and no, no long um you know stream of consciousness stuff um, which i think is a shame and i would have loved to have read in the journal about the netherlands but it's just not there ah uh, yeah um, Yilva, so, so Kat mentioned um, you about being able to share more about this. What was your, what did you find um, with your differences? Um, I found um, Anne writing a specific note about the difference uh, in the diary from um, May the 3rd in 1827. And I write it, uh, I will read it aloud. Within my traveling journals that I begun from this time, wishing for easier refer reference to have a separate journal of all my excursions, all that is more strictly private being reserved for this my private journal. So, so she started with traveling notes, uh, journals in um, May 27, but uh, when you look at the, the digitized um, travel journals, they start in June, I think. So there must be um, days that are lost from May and the beginning of June uh, in these notes. But she is very clear on, on the difference that it's more private and strictly private for the her main journal. And perhaps that the need for this is because uh, just this night, she had a terrible row with uh, Mrs. Barlow, um, where Mrs. Barlow uh, snatches off a locket from her throat, a locket that was given from, uh, by Mariana, I think. And um, so she, she perhaps needed to, to express this disappointment with uh, Mrs. Barlow in the, in the journal, in the main journal more than, the, and she wanted to, uh, talk about the travel to uh, Elmenonville, it's the place that they were going to. And um, there, I believe she visited the, the tomb on Rousseau, I should suppose. And um, perhaps she wanted to have that ex excluded from the diaries. 
Very interesting. Um, Yvonne, what was, um, did you, did you see some major differences in yours? Oh, well, um, basically uh, more practical. There's no code at all in the Norway part and um, not much mention of Anne Walker either really, but it seems to be like she wants to remember things. She's learned things about Norway Norwegian culture, uh, pay, pensions, customs. And so she writes these things down because they're hard to remember, I guess. But the rest she probably thought she could add when she were doing the proper journal, I guess. Hmm. Very cool. Um, so with all of these differences that she was doing and, and um, keeping track of, and we've got the travel journals and the main journals. Um, so um, I know a lot of you have come across some really funny passages um, on these travels and some crazy things that have happened. Um, so I'm going to start with Amanda. What was the uh, funniest passage that you've transcribed or, or found on your travels? It may not be the funniest, but it's, uh, it, it definitely made me laugh and it made a few of us laugh when I shared it. So I will read it to you. So this is from Monday, the 2nd of June, 1828. And she's, with, she's traveling with Sibella McLean through Scotland and they decide to take a little row out to an island on one of the locks. And the island is called Ellen's Island. At three, after a pretty row, somehow rather disappointed with the lake, landed on Ellen's Island. Very pretty wooded rocky spot. The views from it towards the lake upon the Trushaks, beautiful. 20 minutes on the island and then rode on a little farther and a far more extended view of the lake, but raining pretty smartly. And from the moment of leaving the island, the wind very high, water roughish, so turned back. Fine wooden rock, pretty, but not tremendous. <laughs> So yeah, she could be uh, quite sort of dry and cutting about some things <laughs> and really overstate, overstated about some other things. It, yeah, it's interesting to see. Yeah. Um, Doriana, what was your, um, what's your passage that your favorite or funniest? I, I love her dry, hu dry humor. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's, it's the juxtaposition of the crazy things that she does, the amazing things that she does in, in the mundane. For example, one of my favorite ones is famous, uh, you know, I, I leaned on a Persian, Persian inscription and, and wrote my notes and, and, you know, then I took a shit and, and killed some fleas in my drawers. Uh, <laughs> but also an, an, an excellent example of dry humor is um, when um, she's in Moscow and uh, this, um, English clergyman that that, uh, that they know comes and bothers them about oh how are you going to travel all by yourself you two ladies you need a man you need a man and, and this is not the first time he's done it and uh, he's he's traveling uh, he's 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 uh, frightening um, and walker with with all his uh, nonsense about dangers and whatnot and and Endlister is getting really impatient and finally um, he suggests that they might take his clerk who is a, a really fat gentleman and advanced in years and 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 then and really loses her rack here. And she says, this was too much. I said, we're very much obliged, but the clerk to judge from his age and dimensions would be worse to get about than either of ourselves and would besides be a better mark to hit. As I really want to see this um, acted out by, by Soren in season four, because it's gonna be hilarious. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Um, Yannicka, so um, of course your travels that have Mariana, um, what is um, some funny stuff that happened with them? I guess I just really want to say that, that like some of you have said before, she is just very funny, um, even just in, in how she describes things. Um, so I chuckle a lot. Um, I do that when I do my normal um, Western Yorkshire archives uh, transcriptions, um, but also on, when she's traveling. Um, and, and one thing that I thought was quite funny, um, I, I don't know, nobody will be laughing out loud, I don't think, but she describes at one point in The Hague that she uh, spots the Princess of Orange um, getting out of a carriage or going into a carriage, I can't remember. Um, and she describes the people around her and one person, a man, uh, she describes as having wearing some sort of something that looks like a kilt um, and he looks more like a Chinaman than anything else um, and and it just made me laugh and and trying to find the relevance uh, in the historical setting for that you think Netherlands you think you know where where did they have anybody in you know, overseas neighbors I'm I'm not thinking it's probably somebody from Java who was wearing like an Indonesian guy who was wearing um 
some sort of a dress or a skirt type thing, uh, which they did. But it, it's it's just her descriptions are 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 very funny and um, and th this is what makes it very enjoyable to transcribe at all. But then definitely also her travels. Yeah. Um, so Jenna, in uh, um, with Anne being in Wales, please tell us <laughs> the funny stuff that she got into. Yeah. So some of you might be wondering where the whole no goats can't thing came from. <laughs> and um, that was from her trip in North Wales. Um, she had this process when she was traveling where she would write little notes in the margin um, to mark, you know, important things. So she would put the name of the town that they were in or, you know, a site that they saw or something to make it easier for her to find things when she was referencing back. And there was this one day, usually it's like pretty obvious why she's marking these things out. You know, it seems like relevant, useful information. And there's this one day where she um, gets, here's this story and is very distressed. And I'll read what she, read what she says. She says, we have seen not one goat yet. They are all destroyed on Lord Guadir's estate on account of their hurting his plantations. He about seven years ago sent an order that every tenant should get rid of all he had by Landworth's Fair in September. This was giving them too little time and caused them great loss, which would have been remedied by giving them till Christmas instead of September. So she was so distressed by this story about that there weren't any goats left that she thought it was important enough to just write no goats in the margins so that she could come back to this very important information. <laughs> and then she even refers to it again a few days later, like towards the end of the trip. She's very distressed by the fact that she has seen only one goat in the entire time that she was in Wales, and it was a tame one in Carnarvon. <laughs> so if it was tame, does she not count it as a real goat? <laughs> like <laughs> it, was a, it was a tame little thing. <laughs> oh, dang that little goat. <laughs> not even an interesting goat. <laughs> Ooh, I like goat disappointment. That's that's a new word. <laughs> awesome. Um, Yilva, what um, what did you come across in yours for the humor side? Um, well, it's not much to, I don't know if it's really funny, but I laughed when I read it because she is so uh, it was in uh, Österby, she was uh, found a mine that she didn't know of, and she was so excited. She repeats, I had no idea of this mine. And then uh, she, um, they were, went up to the mine, and then they sent uh, the, the man back to uh, fetch um, Ann Walker's uh, sketchbook and some other stuff. And she notes, and my traveling cap. And then in brackets, she says, Casket, blue cloth from Jobs, London, 1835. And I just, she's so excited about this mine and, uh, and all the other stuff and that, that she has to put in these details about this hat and what it was and when she bought it. Uh, I think that's so much Anne. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yvonne, what, um, what did you come across with yours? So there's so many things that I find funny. A lot of them funny for a Norwegian, of course, when she says everybody should see Drummen, a town that everyone has always known was so ugly and she loves it. Uh, it's nice now, but there's things like that. But I think um, what we'd like to take, uh, we were going to talk about people she meet. I don't know if we have time for it, but the way she's shortly dismissive of some people. I think she's very funny when she dismisses uh, things and people and I'd like a quote she meets um, a woman Mademoiselle Bielka and I'll just say how uh, Mademoiselle Bielka sent uh, to say she would call here from one half to one uh, to two quarter a past middle age second rate person prosing could not understand her inquiring after Miss Mrs Courtney Stewart so she's uh, fairly dismisses of, of this sort of second rate uh, person and this turns out, so I had to dig a lot to find Miss Bielka, who was then actually part owner in a copper mine 
uh, doing all sorts of stuff just like Anne would do. And I mean, winning, um, uh, having people taken to court and win stuff and doing all and being regarded as a sort of a difficult woman, like we would probably think men would do with a um, Lister herself. And uh, and uh, I, I, I thought that she's actually uh, been like this before when she, she doesn't really like uh, women to be like herself. And uh, I found a passage um, about Miss uh, Pickford that we probably you all have read about where she describes uh, Miss Pickford as uh, uh, better informed than some ladies and the godsend uh, of a companion in my present scarcity. But I am not an admirer of learned ladies. Uh, so this is from um, uh, from a book from Helena Whitbread uh, back in in um, uh, 23. But I think this is a pattern here that she dismisses people who could be similar to herself, uh, and the way she dismisses things like Paul Smith, the guide who knows nothing of these things. She says it so many times. Paul Smith, he knows nothing of this. Oh. Uh, she's so. Uh, short and blunt and dismissive in a very funny way, I think. <laughs> it's very, uh, for anybody that watched Game of Thrones, very, uh, you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love it. Um, so, okay, so now that we've touched on some of the funny stuff and some of the little eccentricities of Anne when she's traveling. So I know there's lots of really cool stories about some of the dangerous situations she gets herself in and doesn't even probably realize how dangerous they are. Um, so Marlene, uh, do you wanna share some of those uh, dangerous experiences that you found in your, in your transcriptions? Okay, so they were in Russia. It was the middle of the night and they were going down the Volga on a carriage and suddenly the lamp falls and she's like, this doesn't work. So she puts her head out of the carriage and shouts um, and asks if, uh, if they are in the station because the carriage stopped suddenly. Uh, so here's what she wrote after that. Nobody answered, all flat and snow, no house. But soon the plunging of the horses in water and the noise of the men and the breaking of ice showed that our station was on the bursting ice of the Volga. Luckily, <laughs> Anne was not apparently aware of danger. The servants, Kibitka, always following, had avoided the bad place uh, and were on, on Blas Ferme, 20 or 30 yards to the right and ahead of us. They said our men did not know the road, but their men did know the, this place. No danger because plenty of thickness of ice beneath. I doubt this. We were luckily sufficiently near the, to the right bank to be not over deep water. One of the horses sunk almost overhead. I think his feet were on the ground. Luckily, the ice on, on which the carriage rested did not give way so as to let the water get inside. Gross came to us and advised uh, our not getting out as he got up to, to the knees in water. We took their horses and were at last, after 10 minutes or more, skewed round to, uh, onto fine ice and pursued our way without further disagreement to Pichuga, good station house, and at a little distance, the village uh, and the neat little uh, white church, steep ravine, ravine pitch, again down upon our Volga. So basically, this is a problem with drivers. Uh, it's sometimes they get lost. Sometimes drivers get them in trouble. This is like the first close call they had with the driver. The ice broke, the horse went down, but she's glad and Walker was not afraid because they almost died. But well, there's that. Uh, later on, when they are arriving in Tiflis, uh, the drivers are so bad, she refuses to pay them because they literally destroy the carriage, <laughs> making a turn. They break a part of the kibitka and they are literally made to go on foot to the station house. Uh, but this, these are the troubles with the drivers. Then you have another funny, funny bit, uh, well, and dangerous. It's funny because she's perfectly calm, but I, I doubt that, well, she was that calm. Uh, they were going from a little fort uh, after Vladikavkaz on the road to Tiflis, and they were warned repeatedly that the mountain tribes could try to attack them and rob them or kill them. So what does she decide to do? Okay, it's fine, we'll go. They have a, a caravan with some people, including a Russian officer. 
uh, not too, uh, too, much, uh, too long after they leave the fort, uh, she's told that another R Russian officer was uh, picking up uh, the timber, uh, sorry, um, wood for, uh, for fires, got himself killed, and they brought him to the fort uh, half dead. Uh, or, well, already dead. Anyway, uh, but then they decide, let's keep going. Let's take the kibitka. The kibitka is full, it's heavy, and it moves very slowly. Um, so they are going slowly uh, at what she calls a foot space. She's not pleased with that because and has that need for speed. Uh, and suddenly they see them. Uh, they see some uh, thirty guys on horseback coming for them. And she takes the pistols and it's all ready for the standoff. So this is a a very uh, stressful moment. I mean, they are going at the foot space and there are those guys stopped looking at them, and she's ready for a fight she assesses how many people they they can use to put up a fight and she realized they are grossly outnumbered but they still keep going and they are very lucky with that one because uh and basically um the, uh, told also that the, those mountain tribes answer to the the command uh, commandants and on that on those areas so if they uh, do something to travelers and anyone gets hurt, they will get a retribution from the, the authorities. So that kind of co uh, covers them. Uh, and once again, she uh, explains, for example, her servant <laughs> trembled from head to foot and said on my rallying uh, her about it, that if she had known nothing, no, not George with her husband, would have induced her to come. So. <laughs> That one uh, was uh, a close, a fairly close call. Um, and they lived to tell the tale, but those are the, the troubles with the mountain, uh, mountain tribes. Later on, uh, after Kutais, when they are near the Rioni um, River, um, they have another episode on their way, their way back to, to Kutais. Uh, and this time, Anne Walker is the one who pushes them to go forward. They are like three hours away from the next stop. And then Lister is like, okay, let's stop here uh, overnight. We rest and then we move. Uh, but Anne Walker is not having it. And she's trying to reason like, but there's no difference. Let's let's stay here and then go. But Anne is like, no, let's go. So suddenly uh, they, they start uh, going on their way. And at some point they find themselves uh, groping their way in the dark uh, fear uh, with the fear of a, a mountain tribe possibly attacking them, and that time is worse because she and Lister decide to leave uh, her pistols and the gunpowder and everything else back at Kutais for safekeeping. So, if something were to happen, they could not outrun anyone because those mountain roads are like uh, sheep's trails, they are worse than bad. <laughs> Uh, they only had horses that were seriously tired by then. And then at, and, and Walker at some point suggests, let's send the Cossack ahead to the next stop. Mm, well, it's, it's not uncommon for them to do that, to, to send their papers and have uh, horses uh, on the way. But then Enlisted is like, no, no, don't. Why? Why would we do that? If they sent the Cossack ahead, they would be without an escort. I mean, they could have other men, but with them, but the Cossack is the one they trust the most to, uh, to keep them safe. So that's another funny one. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Lister can get herself in all sorts of situations. Um, so we have a couple minutes left for, the, for, the, for one last piece. Um, I know we were gonna try to do a Q&A, but with 90 minutes and all of these travels, it's just, you know, well, it, we could just talk forever. Um, um, so for this last bit, um, Yannicka, so what with, um, Anne and Mariana, what sort of dangerous things did they get into, if any? Well, I guess the, the main dangerous thing that they did do, uh, get into was that sort of, um, the war situation, which I guess calling it a war in, um, in, in, um, you can't really compare it to a war right now, obviously, but there were, battles going on near where they landed in the Netherlands and there was 
you know, murmurs in the background, not far away. They could have heard stuff. I don't know if they actually did hear any cannons, but the guy that they met had, uh, and there was talk of bodies piled onto carts uh, being driven to Rotterdam, whether that was to hospitals or to mortuaries or whatever, I don't know. So I, this is what made Mariana very scared. Um, um, but I, as you then read on um, throughout their tra travels, I mean, the issue was really in the south of the Netherlands because this was all about Belgium wanting the independence from the Low Countries, from from um, the Netherlands, um, and they actually travelled up the way northway. So um, they actually moved away from from the danger. Uh, and I mean, other than that, I, I guess the, the nearest dangerous thing. Uh, that they might have done was climb to the top of churches where Mariana might have stopped halfway through because she, she must have thought it was a bit scary but then Anne obviously happily climbed all the way up but these are not these are normal things for Anne aren't they um, <laughs> so that's not really dangerous and people go there even today to the top of the, the Dom Tower in Utrecht um, so yeah no not really that much danger but arriving in the Netherlands was a bit scary yeah wow Okay, so that puts us um, at the um, top of the session. So I wanna thank um, all of the panelists for sharing all of your stories about the travels. Like I said, there is so much here. And if anybody has not checked out the story maps that exist out there, um, go to um, um, Analyster Timeline and see the story maps and um, you can literally retrace and steps in all of these travels and it's and it's just amazing so anybody that wants to learn more uh, go check out those travel those travel maps story maps and we'll go ahead and, and um, end this now thanks everybody.